I, I don't. The only connection I think is that the gentleman who was the English translator in the translation team of one Sikkimese and one English, one American guy, Evans Wentz, his name was. Uh, he had been, he was a folklorist by PhD, you know, from I think Oxford, although he was American, and his dissertation was about Saint Patrick in Ireland. And he then heard about, and then he read things like the Egyptian Book of the Dead in his PhD study at Oxford, Western things. And then he heard about Padmasambhava, you know, the great, uh, the great Siddha, the great adept who went to Tibet. And he thought, wow, well, he sort of did in Tibet what, what St. Patrick did in Ireland. So he was kind of, you know, he tamed the local deities like St. Patrick tamed the Druids, you know, although one is for Christianity, one is for Buddhism. And so he was just interested in that figure, and then he became a major, the first great translator into English of Tibetan things because he became so fascinated by what he discovered. And so when he, when he discovered this uh, book of natural liberation through learning in the between, he thought it would be more meaningful to Westerners who sort of in the, the esoteric types, you know, had heard of the Tibetan Book of the Dead. And so he thought, well, we'll just call this, th I mean, he'd heard of the Egyptian Book of the Dead, so he'll, we'll call it the Tibetan Book of the Dead, and that'll attract their interest, you know. And he got Carl Jung to write a preface, a foreword, introduction, and so it became kind of a thing, you know. And it's, it's amazing, there's like a half a dozen translations, and all of them are very useful and very popular. Mine is like this fifth one, and there's been one or two since, and mine is uh, by far my most popular book. Although it was never promoted, it was never, it was what's called a backlist book in the publishing industry, uh, part of a series, you know. And yet it's by far the most popular thing I ever did is my study and translation of this book. Because, you know, it has a kind of captive market. People are croaking right and left <laughs> all the time, and their loved ones also are worried about it and what they do, what, what, it, what it means. So, so they, um, so they go. So, uh, so let me read just, um, well, uh, then, any other question? Anybody else have a question? Okay. So, on page, anybody who has this version, if you have another version, it's called The Prayer of the Three-Body Mentor Yoga. So, I don't know what they're translating. Maybe I'll bring that other volume since some of you have that big one, uh, which is done since mine. They might say Guru Yoga. I'm translating Guru as Mentor or Lama. And that's just, I thought, a good omen to read the initial prayer. Okay. On, the, on my version, it's page 99. And, it, and the, the block capital ones are the ones of the original, and then I have commentary in on uh, regular type. So, um, um, ka, it's like it sounds like that. Ka, ah, you know. Um, ka, ah, who knows why they put that sound? It's like a kind of war whoop, a whoop cutting through ka. Kind of means, what do I say it means? Av indicates voidness, the lack of rigid identity in all things, okay. And ka represents the ah sound of cosmic creativity emerging from the k position of beginning. K being the first consonant in the Sanskrit and Tibetan al 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 alphabet. And ah is the mantra of enlightened speech. Oh good, I figured it out. <laughs> Probably from a commentary. Or om av ka ah. Ka. Actually, the K is uh, not an aspirated K, it's, uh, which we have in English. It's a cerebral K, which means it's ka. If you can pronounce K without any breath coming out of your mouth, then you will get what that sound is. It's like the sharpest sound that you can make, sort of ka. And that's considered the beginning sound in, uh, in, um, in Buddhist cosmology, you could say. It's like that, the, the K consonant. Actually, consonants themselves have no sounds in Sanskrit linguistics. Consonant is only a position of the mouth. Then until a vowel enlivens the consonant, the consonant is like inert. It cannot be pronounced. And therefore, the universe, during the periods of dissolution between universes, between universe cycles, you know, big bangs and big crunches, sort of thing, in the Indian science, what is lying around are not atoms or waves or what, or dead energies. What is lying around are unarticulated Letters. Their letters are lying around. Energy is shaped in letters, but without it, there's no vowel. And when the Brahma, the creator, is the sound uh, uh. And the Brahma is the uh. And so uh comes, and then uh picks up all the consonants and starts articulating words, and that articulates 
uh, things of the universe. It's kind of fun. It's a, a very linguistically. Or the Indian culture was very language oriented. But if you, 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 you remember in the New Testament of the Christians, they have in the beginning was the word. What does that mean? You know, it's interesting. Okay, so avka a, om avka a, and it reads to the unborn, non-developing, truth body mentor. In the palace of the perfect, all-pervading realm of truth, with reverent devotion, ardently I pray. Self-freed, without abandoning, misknowing delusion, I freely accept the perfect truth body blessing as effortless, non-artificial, primal wisdom. So now, now a Buddha, like I started off by telling you that what a Buddha was, was this being that feels they are everything, has come to feel they are everything, but everything in certain kind of like specific. So that body that you have when you become a Buddha is called the true, your ultimate body as a Buddha, body of oneness with all things or non-differentiation with all things, is your truth body, body of truth. In other words, that's your real body. You feel everything is your body. Like you, like I feel my body, you know, like, like I, I'm in it, I'm connected to it, I can move it around, and I feel like I'm in it even if I don't move it. So you feel like the whole universe is your body when you become a Buddha, and that's called your truth body, your dharma body, your freedom body, or whatever you want to call it, however you want to translate dharma, reality body, okay? So now the mentor or the guru, that is the, because the, which is the Buddha, and the Buddha is considered the great, the most important thing about a Buddha is not some sort of magical thing or all this kind of thing, but the fact that the Buddha is a teacher. That's why they call him a guru. Because what we need is teaching. Because we are suffering because we're ignorant. And more worse than ignorant, actually, we're misknowing. In other words, what we think we do know is wrong. And yet we stubbornly cling to it. And then this causes us endless suffering. So we need a teacher. Uh, and that's why Buddha manifests as a teacher. So mentor means like lama, guru, teacher, mentor. But it's a kind of teaching that the teacher that models the teaching, not only just mouths the teaching, but models it, is the teaching. So that's why I, like, I choose the term mentor. Unborn means <clears throat> that, that because the Buddha is a being who has felt all reality as his body. He's connected to the uncreated, the unborn, the reality that is not artificial, that is not made at some time and then destroyed, but has always been there. And therefore it is beginningless and infinite and therefore unborn. It was not brought together by elements, something as differentiated from other things. It is the unity, the, the indivisible unity of all of the infinite things. So it is unborn and it doesn't develop, it doesn't change. And so that truth body, of that non-developing, in other words, none of this is happening. On that level of the absolute reality, there's nothing happening. This is just one huge space of vibrant, infinite, blissful energy. Bliss, freedom, indivisible, or bliss, void, indivisible, they call it. Nirvana, samsara, indivisible. And when you feel that into your body, then you're a Buddha, and then you are a truth body mentor. In the palace of the perfect, all-pervading realm of truth, that's the realm that you are one with, and it's perfect and it's all-pervading, and he's saying like a palace, but in a way, you know, it's not like a building where there's things inside it and other things outside it. It's everything, and yet it's like, so therefore it's the ultimate palace. It's everywhere. With reverent devotion, ardently I pray to that being. I feel I'm separate from that being. I'm an ignorant person. I'm a person who's faced with life and death, but with great energy, fervently and ardently, I pray to that being that is me, actually. I know is my deeper reality, at least I have, because I have understood something about Buddhist philosophy, I realize that there is, a, it's like, it's like, it's not that difficult to understand, actually. I mean, for example, now we think we're all finite beings, right? Doesn't everybody here think they're a finite being? So finite means opposite of infinite, right? And yet, Infinity, you're also infinity, because infinity incorporates you. You are infinite, right? Because infinity can't be excluded from 
your boundary. You can't, you can't be the only finite thing and everything else is infinite because infinite has to be, be everywhere. So therefore, you are permeated through and through with infinity. So the finite is permeated with infinity. That's easy to understand, actually. In a way, in a way, the infinity is a little bit irrelevant because we feel finite in one way. But in another way, since in reality, we are also permeated with the infinite, in a way, we are part of a... And since the infinite, in some sense, is undifferentiated, then we are actually infinite, but we don't feel that viscerally. We feel finite and limited and that other things are different from us. And we feel they are f finite and limited. And infinity is only like a neg negation from our point of view. It's like something that almost we can't grasp. And yet, logically speaking, we are that infinity as well as being finite, at the same time as being finite, since we can't exclude that the infinity is us. Okay, a body, mind, etc. Infinity is in all of the movements within us. And somehow in the context of infinity then, our sort of movement, our life and death, our whole process, somehow is completely lost. It's completely gone in a way. So we're kind of goners. <laughs> we're, and on that level, we're infinite, unborn, undeveloping. And if we felt that, we would feel this vastness and this freedom. Although, in a way, what, what, what would it mean to feel that? The feeling itself would be vast and infinite and free. So it's kind of like a boundary concept, in a way. It's kind of, we can't imagine what that's like, because we only think of feeling as some particular thing that's differentiated from some other thing, if you follow me. And we have kind of threshold experiences, like some of the best kind of experiences we have, kind of like, you know, transcendent experiences where we sort of pass out or faint. They seem to be like on, a, on an event horizon of losing ourselves. You know, we seek thrills or we seek pleasures or things where we kind of get lost in them. So, the, and the pleasure maybe is the, is the transition from being this bound thing that's sort of holding on to its limits and then releasing in li unlimitedness. And so, it's, uh, we, can, we connote that pleasure being the release part. So, in a way, we can't imagine... The unlimitedness itself being a pleasure, because we sort of lost then, but 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 we think of it as only a, we think of the threshold as being the place, but that's because we've never really seen through the the false way we reify our limitation. But anyway, I don't want to go into that far in too far. I'm just trying to make it, make it understandable to us this concept of the unborn, non-developing truth body mentor that is the teacher or the Buddha as really being this vastness. And, and But we are not, when we're reciting this prayer, we're praying to that infinite presence around us and even in us, but which we know we can't quite grasp. But we're praying to it. And then we're saying, well, if we really thought about it, we would be self-freed. That is to say, as we are, we are free because it's like as we are, finite beings, we are infinite without even having to abandon our misknowing delusion because even the process of our being confused and deluded and... Even our thinking we're not finite is also fi infinite. So we're automatically, self is just a short form, metric causa, for automatically freed, almost you could say, automatic. So automatically freed without, self-freed without abandoning misknowing delusion. So even in our delusion, we're freed. And I freely accept the perfect truth body blessing, that is, the joy of being infinite with this one infinite, omnipresent, blissful, energetic, uh, stable, unborn, absolute body of Buddha. I accept that perfect, that blessing of that perfection as effortless, non-artificial, primal wisdom. And that is to say a kind of intuitive awareness of oneness that I also have naturally when I get below my sort of conceptually striving and grasping mind, which only can grasp things artificially that are artificially divided from me and like recognized by concepts and so forth, and primal because it's the kind of knowledge, that kind of wisdom is the kind of knowledge that when you gain it, you realize you always had it. Certain type of intuition where when you, you sort of, it seems to be new at first, but then as you're leaning into it, let's say, or, or settling into it or plunging into it joyfully, 
it's like it was always there. You feel completely secure and safe about it because you always felt that way, actually. It's that deeper feeling, intuitive feeling of connection to everything, of infinite connectedness, safe and sound, infinite connectedness to everything, right? So that's the first verse, to the unborn, non-developing truth body mentor. So in a way, this is the foundation of Buddhism, those even new to Buddhism, though some of you have said you were. So this is the foundation. This is the Buddha's foundational insight that he achieved, which was this insight that the reality of the world is nirvana, is the freedom from suffering. The reality of the world is that. In reality, everything is fine. Everything is all right. There's no fear. There's no danger. There's no, nothing can go wrong in reality. Oh, in reality, yes. And unfortunately, we are perceiving that reality as unreality usually. So here at the prayer, by just having this prayer, no one is saying that we can automatically know reality fully, but we're sort of pushing toward that aspect in ourselves, somewhere deep sense of connection. For example, I mean, it's not, again, it's not so terrible. For example, I see the wall over there in the paintings. I see you, the people. I see the carpet. Okay. And they, I see them as if they're just self-evidently there as they are. But of course, that's not what happens. What happens is that photons, I mean, and even, of course, that explanation is not a quantum one, so we don't, finally, maybe quantum people say we don't really know exactly what does happen, but there is a layer of explanation that I can say where particles of light bounce off surfaces, go into my eye, you know, lens, and go down to the neurons that are the optical neurons, nerves, you know, which are themselves are made of m atoms and molecules and subatomic energies and so forth. And then with the, and the interaction of the photons that are bouncing off objects around light waves or whatever they are, then mobilize something else, some other neurons in my brain where I have all kinds of stored concepts of like a lady looking serious, who's thinking hard, <laughs> and uh, and now smiling, and then uh, a, a zafu, and then a carpet, and then a wall, and then I have the whole huge storehouse of things that I recognize. And so there's this very complicated process, and I'm thinking I just see these things there, like as if that's just sort of they are there, like that. But actually, what is going on is a bunch of neural processes of incredible complexity. And that's not even beginning to get into the layer of explanation about my deeper awareness, how it sort of attends to that process and makes the interpretations based on the, the matching the concepts with the sense or sense perceptions and so forth, right? Very complicated thing. So what I'm actually doing is, is I, I am a bunch of neurons interacting with a bunch of light waves, in fact. And so it shouldn't be impossible technically Two, if I got rid of all the other distractions I have of thinking things and recognizing things and being conditioned to operate in a routine way, I could get back to just the buzzing, blooming confusion, as William James called it, of neuron acting on photon, photon and neuron interacting. You know, at the submolecular, subatomic level, because that is actually what I'm doing when I see. You follow me? But normally I think, well, no, I can't deconstruct that. I have to see the way I see. But in fact, I've learned to see the way I see. If I got really stoned or you know, someone slipped me a mickey or I got, fell off a cliff or something, I, would, could see, I might see very differently. And people, when they do get stoned, when they hallucinate, it's because somehow those, some of those processes are not functioning temporarily. And so then they partially function and then they keep projecting things and you keep recognizing things in the photon wave thing that are actually not there, they're things that are stored in your mind. And, but the mind is trying to gain a grasp over the swirling energy patterns that are all that you're seeing because the other, the conceptual parts of your mind are temporarily suspended by whatever you're stoned with. And, but, and a yogi doesn't use such things as stone because they do it more consciously, but they get to where they become conscious of all of those processes and they can suspend certain ones and they can see it a deeper vision. And finally, of course, they are one with all of the energies around them.